Hey everybody, welcome back to Sounds Like a Drum, Cadence Independent Media Production. Today we are tackling a really fun subject, which is trying to recreate, at very least, the vibe, if not the exact sound, of a snare drum that you've heard on a record. This comes up in personal playing and also sometimes on a record session when somebody says, we want this song to sound like that song, and the snare drum is just like the biggest part of that. Today we're going to do three different tunes that conveniently have almost identical beats and also kind of start with just drums. And what the idea here uh, is going to be is that any drum you have can make a lot of different sounds, but there are certain ways to kind of hedge your bet toward getting the sound that you're after. We've talked about that a ton in lots of videos. But specifically today, we're coming from a perspective of I want to make as close to that sound as I can for a certain track. Um, this comes up in the studio a lot. This also comes up for me sometimes in live situations where I'm modifying the drum with some kind of muffling or something sitting on it to get a certain kind of character. Um, in the end, the variables that exist when it comes to a fully produced, recorded, mixed, mastered, and released snare drum sound are just enormous. And so the idea of actually legitimately recreating every facet of it, it I don't really worry about that, and I don't think you should worry about it either. However, the character of the sound and the emotional content and the vibe of it, that's super important, and there are some variables that are more important than others, and that's basically what we're gonna cover today. And thanks again to Promark by Diderio, our presenting sponsor, for keeping us in sticks. I'm gonna actually use a bunch of sticks today because uh, it actually is a choice that affects the sound when you're going for this kind of like meticulous recreation of a sound. Okay, so you pull your song out, you're listening to it, and you're thinking, that snare sounds ridiculous, I want my snare drum to sound like that. So, what are the variables that we should be concerned with? Um, first of all, I want to take what your snare drum is out of the equation. The model, the make, the size, all of that stuff. Let's forget about that. Let's forget about the heads for a second, even, because... Even you know if you're dealing with a drummer that you know like what heads they use or whatever, there's no telling what happened in the studio. There could be anything going on. It might not even be their drum. It might be something they found in a closet. Like that's a real thing. So we have to think about variables that are not instrument specific, but more about like the sound of it. And the sound when I listen to a snare drum in a track that I'm trying to emulate, you know, if not exactly recreate, is we need to think about muffling. We need to think about pitch. We need to think about what effect the room is having on the sound, how roomy is the sound, is it a big room sound or is it super duper tight? Because that's gonna change what we do with the drum. Once I've thought about those things, I'll add in the idea of like, maybe the right heads to use if, if that's an option. Or if I have multiple drums, I'll try and think about the character of the sound I'm hearing and make a drum choice based on that. But today, we're imagining a scenario where you maybe have one or two drums and you're trying to get this particular sound for the track. The first track that we're gonna do is One Headlight by The Wallflowers. Uh, it's sort of handy that it starts out basically with drums alone. Um, this was a big hit for them. It was a big career moment for Matt Chamberlain because he was playing in that band at the time. And uh, of the three tracks we're doing today, I know exactly what the drum is on this one. It's a Noble and Cooley piccolo solid maple. I think it's a 14 inch diameter. Um, it used to hang on the ceiling at Don Bennett's shop in Seattle. I can tell from the track just from listening to it that it's pretty wide open. I think there's nothing on it. If there's anything at all, it's a tiny bit of tape, maybe. Um, it's tuned pretty high, not choked out, but pretty high. Um, the snare wires are not really flopping around. They're pretty well brought up to the head. Um, he's hitting it pretty hard. Uh, definitely hitting rim shots, which is another thing to consider also, is if you're hitting in the center or if you're catching the rim, because that is part of the sound, obviously. Um, and lastly, there's quite a bit of room sound in there, so if you get this sound in your house and you're hitting it, it's not going to sound like the record in front of you. If you take it in a big room or like a church or something, you might start to get some of that kind of big bloom in the sound that you hear, um, which is a huge part of all kinds of rock records, all the way back from like Big Band to Zeppelin to, you know, this stuff. Um, this particular track is also our 90s example. We have an 80s example today, and we also have a aughts example. Also, never forget that virtually anything you're hearing coming out of a major studio is going to have 
a little, if not a lot, of different kinds of compression and EQ on the drum set, which is going to bring out different parts of the sound. It's going to bring out different parts of the kit in different ways. And it's going to really color the whole sound of the track because all the other instruments are sitting in the ambiance of the drums. So even if you're recording yourself, there may still be some discrepancies there, which again is why like trying to just microscopically copy a sound is a little bit of a crazy errand to try to do when the real reason you like the sound is because of how it makes you feel and we're trying to capture that. So since I know what the drum is in this song, I chose the thing from my collection that fits it closest, but kind of intentionally, it's not identical. It's a little bit deeper, it's a craviato, but it is solid maple like the drum on the track. The drum on the track I believe has die cast hoops, this one has triple flange, but we're in the ballpark here. It's one ply maple, it's not super deep, um, and we have tuned it up real high. We have also added a 57 on the snare so that we can kind of fold that sound in a little bit and get a little bit closer to the overall vibe on the track um, and give you a little bit more of what might happen if you were doing this, like say in a home studio with a minimal miking setup. And as usual, no compression, no EQ, we're not doing any of that. Now before I play this, please jump on the link above or the link in the description below to listen to this track and then come and kind of see how it compares to what we did here. So what I went after here was listening to the pitch, um, listening to the pitch of the overtones in particular, um, listening to how much snare sound there is, getting a feel for how hard I need to hit it, that it is rim shots, it's not just like kind of fat back in the center. And as always, for me, making sure that the bottom head is not choked out. It's tight because we need articulation and we don't want a wider sound, which is what you get when you pitch the snare side down but it still needs to have a tone, it still needs to move the shell and not choke out. Now as an aside for me, uh, the stick choice here does make a difference and playing a high pitched cutting drum like this, a big heavy stick gets a wider, fatter sound, a thinner stick like a jazz stick will get a shorter, sharper sound, maybe move a little less air and maybe be a little more articulate. So these are choices you can make um, as you're kind of searching for the sound that you need. Don't forget also to not over tension the snare wires. We need to make sure that we're not choking the head with those either. And um, all of the examples today are going to have uh, specific sort of tensions on the wires that you know in this case is fairly tight, fairly articulate, but not choked out. If I hit the drum softly in the center, I still have a clear sound. Another thing that's actually super important and that uh, I actually notice that a lot of people don't pay as much attention to as they ought to um, is not just consistency of uh, rim shots or not rim shots, but also consistency of strike zone. Because if you're gonna use a wide open drum that has no muffling on it at all and you're gonna play rim shots and you want them to be the same or at least as close to the same as you can get them, you have to hit the drum in the same place, in the same way, at the same velocity or as close as you can get. And I, I have noticed people getting worried about the overtones coming out of their drums. When I go and hit the drum, I don't hear what they're hearing. And it's because I'm choosing where to strike the drum and how hard to have or not have a certain amount of overtones. And just as an aside, I'm gonna play a little bit right now just to demonstrate this. If I hit it in the center, or if I get a little bit off of the center, it starts to get real messy. And part of playing a wide open drum is knowing where you're aiming and being very accurate with that. There's also a psychological sort of perception of tones that comes up sometimes that we don't notice in tracks like this that has to do with when two things are being struck at the same time. Now, unlike the other two tracks we're doing today, this track has the kick drum on all four quarter notes, which means that there's kick on the back beats, as we heard, and that means that that's gonna obscure the sound of the snare a little bit and it's gonna color it a little bit. Um, and that's why they did that, you know, because it was a sound that they liked. And if you take it away, you lose some of that sound. And making sure that you are paying attention to the snare and making sure that you're not paying too much attention to the other stuff that's around it, it's very tricky to do. And it takes a lot of practice. 
um, and a lot of it's kind of like ear training in a way, you know, because it's not just tuning. It's like how how do you listen to a sound and what components of the sound are you listening for? And there's a lot going on there. But in the end, again, this isn't about copying a sound. This is about like that feels good. I want this to feel like that. So how close can I get? On to track number two and drum number two. Uh, this is my Acrolyte. It's got a pretty beaten up uh, center dot head on it. <laughs> and we are going after a very fat, snary, no overtone sound from Steve Jordan on a John Mayer track called Vultures. And this is another one that I, again, picked because the beat is super clear. It's super open. It starts with drums alone, so you can really just listen to the snare drum. There's a little less room in this one. It's a little more close up. And there is a ton of snare wire sound in this. Now, it's worth noting as we go through these drums that these all have 20 strand wires on them. But this is going to sound like a lot more snare wire because of the way that we've set the drum up versus the Craviato, which was very direct and very short. Now, this kind of sound really, uh, for me, asks for not catching the rim. It asks for hitting the drum in the center fairly hard, not smashing it because you can choke a drum pretty easily just with velocity when they're tuned this low. Uh, and it also definitely calls for a judicious amount of muffling. I like the handkerchief, as viewers probably know. Uh, moon gels will do this. If you put a boatload of tape on it, it'll do this. Um, some of the products that are, you know, donuts, those sorts of things will go in this direction as well. The idea here is that we want a very warm sound that's got kind of a long note to it. And so what I've done is I've pitched the batter head pretty low. Pitch is not super important because we've got this rag on there that's taking all the overtones out of the equation. The snare side is also brought down a little bit. I've loosened the wires more than they were before when I had this drum tune higher um, at my house. This is virtually the same groove in terms of the orchestration, but there is no kick on two and four in this one. It's just on one and three. This is a snare sound that is definitely receiving some degree of compression because when you're tuning a snare drum down this low, you're going to need a little help to boost out those lows. Um, and it's worth noting also that this isn't a deep drum. Um, we have a six and a half Ludwig here, uh, chrome over brass kind of vibe that you know you might look at and think, oh, that's a deeper sounding drum. But in the end, I just want to make sure people understand that like you can get deep sounds out of a shallower drum. We've made whole videos about this. Um, but the other thing is that an Acrolyte is a very versatile drum, and because it's very lightweight and has a very thin shell, uh, it likes low end. It tunes up high great too, but you'll see that the low version of this with a little muffling is ridiculous. It sounds awesome. Again, as with the last track, please follow the link above or the link down below to get a sense of his sound and then an approximation that we've generated here. Okay, completely different world than the Craviato, and the most important thing with this kind of sound, in my opinion, is making really sure that you don't overtension the snare wires, because it will be very easy to squash this sound, and it will not go to tape, computer, whatever, very well, because the drum itself will be fighting those wires. And don't be afraid of racket coming out of there. It's gonna be a messy sound, relatively. Um, and again, strike zone is important for consistency. With a lot of muffling on the drum, it becomes a little less uh, of like a crucial thing, but the velocity needs to be the same, and generally you wanna to try to hit the same spot. If you're going for actually something that Steve Jordan likes a lot, which is changing up the type of rim shot or the type of backbeat, like playing one in the center, and then the other one like by the edge or something like that. That's awesome too, as long as it's intentional. But if you're all over the place, it's gonna sound all over the place and it's not gonna have that impact and that momentum. Now for me, stick choice for this, it's all about mass and moving a lot of air because we're trying to get low end to come out of this thing. So I definitely carry something in the 5B range or SD2s with me if I'm gonna be doing this. If I'm in a pinch, turn that stick around. We've seen everybody do it, play with the butt, 
Gad does it, everybody does it. And it's great for this because all of a sudden you've gone from nice articulate tip to just a lot of mass, you know? And if you're only playing two and four and you don't need to do a lot of really complicated rudimental stuff where you need the rebound and the tone from the tip, yeah, man, just turn it around. In talking about the snare side of a drum for this particular sort of sound, we do need some motion in that bottom head. I know that there are people that do low tunings with very like tabletop tight snare side heads. And if it works for you, awesome. My experience in the studio under the scrutiny of a lot of microphones is that bringing the bottom head down some makes a big difference. It does put you in even more danger of choking the drum out with the wires. And you can go back and check this out in past videos, but uh, just make sure that you're getting good snare sound at a low dynamic and also at a fairly hard hitting dynamic. And don't be afraid of all of that extra noise coming out of there because that's what gives it that fatness. All right, last but not least, and again, basically the same beat, Michael Jackson, Billie Jean, Ndugu Chancellor, 1982. Immortal groove, ridiculous groove. This is our 80s track, and rather than switch the drum out, I'm actually gonna use the same drum. I'm gonna use basically the same muffling. I'm just gonna tune it really high. And the thing about this, again, with like the general behavior of this drum is it'll do a lot of stuff. Um, it does low really well. It also does high really well. And these sounds, like from Thriller, for instance, are almost a little choky. Like they're pretty high, they're a little boxy, the, the sound is very close. Um, and I've had the best luck with this sound with Acrolytes too. Um, so basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna pitch up the batter head and leave the snare side alone and then only adjust the snare side if we feel like we need to. And then whatever muffling you choose to use, um, I, I think listening to it that this is also center of the drum, not catching the rim, same as the Steve Jordan track. Um, so that's what we're going to do here in an effort to kind of get this sound. This is a super short sound. This is almost like a hand clap or something. You know, it almost doesn't even sound like a drum. It sounds almost like a sample. Um, and, you know, chances are if you're hearing a track that sounds like this today, it's probably a sample or a real drummer with some kind of like help put on top of it. Um, but back then, I mean, they use samples here and there, but somebody played this. So we're going to we're going to go find it. <laughs> Man, this is a fun track, and it cannot be overstated how um, how immortal and well known and and just fantastic this groove is, and how awesome it is that the song starts just with the beat. And it brings to mind, like these other two tunes, that these are not complicated beats. There is no pyrotechnics here, but you can show this to a drummer, you can show these tracks to anybody, and if they've ever heard the song, they're going to know what song it is just from the beat before the rest of the song starts, and. That, as people contributing to a composition as drummers, we have to think about that stuff because we are doing something that people are trying to put a song on top of, you know? And if you can get some kind of character going on in your sound, whatever it is, whatever makes you happy, that can get just some kind of essence in it where the beat has a life of its own and the beat kind of is the song even by itself, you know? I mean, Led Zeppelin, obviously... Nirvana, there's plenty of bands you can name where it's like, oh, that Phil, like you can show it to anybody and be like, oh, I know what song that is. That's a composition, you know, even if it's one and three, two and four and eighth notes, that's a composition. And it is so cool that something so simple can have so much weight and impact without crashing or anything, just, just a groove. So in summation, uh, Basically, what we're trying to do here is encourage you to try to figure out how to make sounds that you like. And the place where we get sounds we like first is by hearing other people play. And no matter what kind of music you like, even if it's electronic music and the path you go down is like putting cymbals on your snare drum or whatever it is, go for the sounds that make you happy. Sometimes I want to play a super cranked up snare drum even though, you know, sometimes that's not the right thing. And other times people are like, we want a snare drum to sound like this track. And I go... Okay, well, I got to get a drum that's going to do something close to that. I got to figure out how to make it sound close to that. You know, if you're a tech, you might have to make the same snare sound every day, you know, or you might have one track where they're like, we want it to be this other thing. So the more experimentation you do and the more you train your ears around these sounds, the more options you're going to have, and the more tools you'll have and the funner making music is going to be. Again, please like, comment, subscribe, hit that alarm so you can get our notifications. Let us know if you have 
ever recreated sounds in a studio or what your favorite sound is that you wish you could find, you know, Van Halen, whatever it is. Thanks again to our presenting sponsor, Promark by Diodario, and talk to you soon.